Susan David is a professor at Harvard Medical School. She is a CEO. She is an executive coach and she is also an author. And most recently, she's just written Emotional Agility, Getting Unstuck, Embracing Change, and Thrive in Work and Life. And we're delighted and honored to have her here with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. If we can just start with what we sort of call a quick fire round, so sure. relatively short questions and uh, relatively short answers. Um, but it started off as an HBR article, did it? It did. It was a top downloaded article in Harvard Business Review. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, why do you think it sort of uh, touched onto such a huge universal nerve or need? Because it's really, I mean, HBR said it was uh, the management idea of the year. So why do you think it's tapped into such a huge need? So in my work with organizations, I think I've got two clues as to why that is. The first is from an organizational perspective. As you know, and as the viewers know, organizations are going through unprecedented change. And so there are multiple demands on individuals and leaders in organizations to be agile and adaptive and inclusive and flexible, and the list goes on. And I think from an organizational perspective, emotional agility really speaks to how do you engage with the individuals and the individual psychology to enable people to be flexible? So that's the organizational perspective. The personal perspective is I think that a lot of individuals in workplaces struggle not just with the pace of change, but with the normal complexity and beauty of being human, that you come to work and you experience feeling put down or you feeling stuck in your career. And I think that the article gave a sense for people of how they could approach those kinds of quandaries in a better and more productive way. Yeah, exactly. So obviously emotional intelligence is out there. Is this a evolution of emotional intelligence or is it just is it a different? So I did my PhD in the area of emotional intelligence and there are aspects of emotional agility that draw on the work of emotional intelligence. For example, the need to be aware of your emotions, uh, the need, for example, to be able to label emotions effectively. But there's also a lot of work in emotional agility that goes way beyond the ideas of emotional intelligence. Um, one example being the very strong focus on values. Uh, emotional intelligence has always claimed to be a values. In other words, it's not aligned with a particular value base. Whereas a core aspect of emotional agility is actually about the idea of values being a personal compass and being very important in the throes of everyday complexity as, as being able to base people. Yeah. Well, I've, I've read the book and I think it's a fantastic book. And actually, when I first saw it, I thought I'd be good at emotional volatility, not agility. So, <laughs> but, so it's, it's good that I've read it and I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so and you're an executive coach, so presumably your hourly rate's gone up quite a lot since you've, uh, since you've done this book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have had no time to do executive coaching since no. the book came out. It's, been a, yeah. it's actually been a beautiful journey to take a project that you feel really passionate about and to see it through to yeah. an end product it's been amazing so I actually have not done any new coaching clients or worked yeah. with new coaching clients I've kept most of my pre-existing yeah. ones for a while yeah, yeah makes sense but uh, talking about how how have you managed to to do it all I mean you are you know a CEO you're, you're a professor and you're you've written a book and I uh, imagine it's probably about 80,000 words or something how, how did you find the time to write that well I found the time by making the time I had actually tried to write a book in the past. I've edited two books, but I tried to write a book in the past. And at that time, I was consulting and traveling from Boston to London nearly every week. And I needed to realize that I'm not the kind of person who writes on planes or when I'm exhausted in hotel rooms. Yeah. So I think like all leaders or like all individuals, if you have things that you believe in, you need to be able to carve out a space in your world in order to bring those things to fruition. And so that's what I tried to do with the support of my family and my friends and, and lots of wonderful people in my life. Yeah. So it's about working out what's the really important things and scheduling time for it, I suppose. That's, that's, yeah. And not just doing it in your spare time when you're, when you're drained of energy and you think that's when I'm going to do it. Um, so if we can just go into the book now, let's, uh, if we can sort of go relatively chapter by chapter, but um, you know, uh, if we can just ask a definition, emotional agility, you know, what is emotional agility? Well, emotional agility presupposes 
that every single day we have tens of thousands of inner experiences. So we have thoughts, uh, I'm not good enough, I'm struggling with this, my boss is undermining me. We have emotions, we have the emotions of anger, of disappointment, of concern, of upset, whatever that emotion might be. And we also have stories about ourselves. I'm not cut out for this career or I would do this if only the circumstances were right. So emotional intelligence is um, essentially the idea of, of problem solving with and about emotions. But emotional agility understands that there are tens of thousands of thoughts, emotions, experiences that go on in our minds every single day. And that how we deal with these thoughts, emotions, and experiences is the single biggest predictor of our effectiveness. It drives our relationships, how we interact, how we parent, how we go through our careers. It drives every single aspect. So emotional agility is essentially around um, what is the way that you navigate these inner experiences in a way that allows you to, leave a, to lead a thriving, intentional life. Right. Okay. And so what's the agile part? So um, agility, the, the agile part of agility is essentially the idea that human beings are evolutionary yeah. predisposed yeah. to jump to very quick, intuitive decision making. And sometimes that decision making doesn't serve us. Uh, I might be sitting in a meeting and I might know in my mind that I need to be an inclusive leader but I might feel undermined by the person that I'm speaking to. And so the, the cognitive part of who we are as human beings might lead me to ignore or to shut down or to stop contributing. And the agility part of emotional agility is how do you navigate that inner experience? How do you unhook from that inner experience, bring your values into the room with you, in a way that then allows you to be effectively agile and responsive to the situation that's right in front of you. Okay, great, fantastic. And this all started, well, I'm sure this wasn't the only thing, but at the age of 16, you were in South Africa and you had some bad news about your father. So and you, you write about it beautifully in the book. So if I can just ask you to share that with us. Sure, sure. So I grew up in South Africa and when I was 16 years old, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And it was a very uh, difficult, as you might imagine, experience. Um, here was this person who I loved more than anything, and he was told that he had months to live. So what I had in those couple of months was two parallel but completely different experiences around emotion. The first was the reality of seeing someone effectively fade away and die. And going to school every day and being confronted with peers who didn't know how to have a conversation about this. So for example, my father died on a Friday and I arrived at school on the Monday and it almost seemed like there was this silent, unwritten agreement among my friends, among my peers, not to mention the word father in my presence because it might upset me. So people stopped talking about what did you do with your father this weekend? And it was, it was quite obvious that there was a huge amount of avoidance that was going on. And of course that parallels so much of how we think about difficult emotion and difficult experience in society. There's, I think, an overabundance of think positive, everything will be okay, affirmations and so on. Um, and in a way, what, what was happening in my experience was dealing with people who were being very positive but were fundamentally avoiding conversation. So that was on the one hand. On the other hand, I had this incredible teacher. And she, over the course of my father's illness, encouraged us to keep journals. And over the time that I was journaling, I started to write about my experience with my father and my regrets, my pain, my sense of loss. And she started in turn to write 
heartfelt comments and questions of me. And it was this incredibly beautiful experience because I would go to school each day and have my lessons as usual, but I had this secret silent correspondence that was going on at night while I was journaling and then handing it in the next day with this teacher. And so what that was, was the counterfoil of the avoidance, just be positive. What that was, was an experience of going to emotion, feeling the pain, and coming out of it at the other end, realizing that that experience had changed me, that it had helped me to be resilient, it had given me insight, and it really became the impetus of my entire career, that one experience, because it started to encourage me to think about how are we told to deal with difficulties in our lives, in organizations, as leaders, and yet, what do we know actually from the research is helpful? Right, fantastic. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. So it's about writing down your feelings, going, working through your feelings, and being able, being able to have those difficult conversations and and just face the reality as, as to what is actually happening. Correct. That's amazing. Um, because you talked, you, you mentioned there about uh, it's not just about affirmations and positive t positivity, but a lot of um, people have made a lot of money and influenced a lot of people. Norman Vincent Peale, that, you know, the book, The um, uh, Power of Positive Thinking yes. and PMA and, uh, you know, and the, the, the law, of, law of the Secret, I think, just talks about focus on the positive, not the negative. You focus yes. on the negative, you get more negativity. So um, you're challenging some uh, pretty uh, well-established established beliefs in the self-help yes. um, yes. <laughs> sort of environment. Um, so, so is that is that the case that, would, that, that, that's, that they're missing the point and there is something more than just that? So I should start off by saying that I've got nothing against happiness. Um, I'm a very happy person. I actually tend to be a very positive person and being happy is great. Uh, happiness is associated with a lot of very good outcomes for us in our worlds. I think what starts to happen though is when people actually are going through difficult experiences um, and by difficult experiences I don't necessarily mean the death of a parent. It could be organizational change. It could be um, I feel like I'm in the wrong career. It could be I've been promoted to being a leader and yet I'm actually not sure if this promotion is connected with who I am at heart. And what starts to happen, and I've seen this with a lot of clients, is sometimes this push to positivity leads individuals to then ignore what is going on for them, ignore that they are maybe upset, uh, ignore that they might be in the wrong career, sometimes even rationalizing, at least I've got a job. And um, what I am speaking up against is the idea that emotions are somehow bad, that, that, that difficult emotions are negative, that they should be pushed aside. Because I believe, and the research again supports this, that emotions are often beacons of things that are important to us. So when you have a sense of disaffection or dissatisfaction or concern, often what it's saying to you is that you are moving away from something of value or that there's this thing that's important and so I think that when people simply deny and push aside their emotions in the service of positivity they actually lose a crucial learning and I also think that that applies not simply to the individual's journey but to the way a leader might deal with a team's emotions. Right, okay. Um, if I can just add to that, one of you mentioned the secret, and one of my it's 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 not absolutely relevant to leadership, but one of the things that I have uh, become more and more concerned about, for example, in the the context of this idea that somehow your thoughts create your reality, is it can actually lead to people feeling responsible for bad realities. So an example is I've got a friend who has been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. She is dying and she has had 
hundreds of people tell her that she just needs to be positive, think positive, that everything will be okay. And this woman has started to experience this as the tyranny of positivity, that somehow if she dies, it's because she wasn't positive enough, mm. as if positive thinking would have cured her cancer. So I think we really get into a very difficult space when we are not allowing people to have experiences that are authentic and real and human. Yeah, absolutely. Now that's, that's fascinating because I think there's the, the other side of it as well is that um, there's a backlash with the, the power of the secret that, that they just say visualization is everything, but they miss the point about execution. That they've actually got to do things as well. There's been some fascinating research that actually looks at uh, the idea of uh, mental contrasting, mm. that when people are trying to change habits and they visualize themselves as an effective leader or a newly thin individual or as newly healthy, that it actually that those individuals are less likely to change their habits because that positive visualization actually almost tricks your brain into believing that you've done the hard work right. that's necessary to get there. Okay. So yeah, you talk about it in the book as well, but it's, it's therefore uh, the power of positive, positive thinking isn't uh, wrong per se, but it's not the panacea and you've got to be both optimistic but also realistic about your current situation. Well, I think what it's, well, one of the core things that I'm talking about is the idea that uh, human emotions are normal. Uh, Charles Darwin, in his book, The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, suggested that emotions have evolved to help us as a species to survive. That emotions help us to communicate with other people. It's very important to know when you're about to be attacked if you're in a savannah in Africa. But just as importantly, if someone in a negotiation is saying, yes, that sounds great, but actually doesn't believe in it. Um, but by the same token, our own emotions help us to communicate with ourselves. And so when you cut off your emotions, you are cutting off a key piece of data. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that emotions should be believed. I'm not saying because you feel angry, it means you've got a right to be angry and you should be angry and you should act on your anger. All that I am saying, or one of the most uh, key things to emotional agility, is the idea that emotions have messages and these messages are just like any other book that you've got on your bookshelf. You don't need to pick up the book and believe the whole story and act on the whole story, but it's a piece of data just like your other piece of data in organizational life. Okay, so as you say, it's about sort of self-talk. It's about understanding, receiving it, not just reacting, but delaying the response and understanding that that's just a human thing that you're going through and it's a, it could be a beacon. It's a, it's a positive thing that you're getting a negative reaction to some extent. Well, it's a, it's a human thing. That's it's right. a human thing. Um, Viktor Frankl spoke about mm. the idea that between stimulus and response yeah. is a choice. Yeah. And in that choice lies our growth and freedom. Yeah. And when people are experiencing an emotion but just automatically shutting it down or automatically um, ignoring it, what they're not doing is they're not allowing themselves to garner the learning that can come from that beacon. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. So, but, you, but you talk about where negative uh, emotions can be a problem and that's if you get hooked on them. What, what did you mean by that? Correct. So what I argue in emotional agility is that emotions are normal. That, that emotions and thoughts are completely normal. And we have thousands of them every single, single day. Yet but you say 16,000 words we say or something. And then we we speak 16,000 thoughts and we have many more thousands of emotions and thoughts that go on inside of us. And one of the key things that I suggest in the book is that what we start to do and often aided and abetted by society is we start to think things like, I shouldn't have the thought, I should have the thought. And we start to get into an internal struggle with ourselves about whether the thought is a justified thought or whether the emotion is a justified emotion. And one of the things that I talk about is the idea of dropping the rope. In other words, giving up the struggle by dropping the rope, engaging with the idea that 
your thoughts are normal and your emotions are normal and you don't need to argue with them or justify them or try to wrestle with them or hustle with them, they are normal. What happens um, where emotions and thoughts often cause us difficulty is it's not in the emotions or thoughts per se, but rather us getting hooked by our thoughts and emotions. And what I mean here is that your thoughts and emotions start to direct the traffic in your life rather than what's most important. So an example might be, um, I feel like a fraud. Okay, that's a very common internal emotional or thought experience that people have. It doesn't matter how uh, senior they are in organizations, it's a very, very common experience. So I'm having the thought that I'm a fraud. I'm having the thought that I'm an imposter. That's a thought. It's completely normal. Your thoughts come and go. Where people get themselves into difficulty is where they start treating their thoughts as fact. I had the thought that I'm a fraud, therefore I am, so I should just shut up in this meeting and stop contributing. I had the thought that my boss is an idiot, therefore I need to resign. So what they're doing in Viktor Frankl's terms is they've got a stimulus, which is the experience, and a response, and they are conflated. There's no space between stimulus and response. The thought or the emotion is directing the action and the activity. Got you. All right. So then, so, and that's where it can lead, therefore, into patterns. It's, a, it's an unconscious thing. Um, and you talk about the danger of patterns. You say, uh, we regularly see executives with reoccurring emotional challenges at work, anxiety about priorities, jealousy of others' success, fear of rejection. Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you uh, actually then go about tackling somebody that does have those, that, that pattern or that reoccurring? So one of the most important things to appreciate in any organizational context is the question of who is in charge here? The thinker, me as the individual, me as the leader, or the thought? Now that's an unusual uh, way to think about our own internal minds, but all of us have been in a circumstance where we've been really upset about something or um, screaming at a customer service agent down the telephone. And we've all had that experience where we are able to almost rise above our thoughts. We call this developing a meta view. And I think the ability to develop a meta view is one of the most critical leadership skills that any individual can develop. Um, so imagine this. I'm having a conversation with a customer service agent. I'm yelling at the person down the phone because they've gotten the phone ball wrong yet again. And it's my 14th hour on the telephone with them and I'm really upset about it. And I'm experiencing this interaction and I'm hooked. My thoughts and my emotions are driving my experience. And then this little voice inside of me says, Susan, this conversation is going nowhere. She's not gonna help you by you screaming at her. This is not effective. And what I've had then, all of us have experienced this, is you're in the experience, you're in the thoughts, in the emotions, but you're able to almost helicopter above your thoughts and emotions. And so that's one of the critical things that we need to be able to develop as leaders or as anyone in an organizational context. Oh my goodness, this change is terrible, this is awful, this is awful, this is awful. And we can get so stuck in it that we lose our capacity to perspective take. We lose our capacity to recognize what the opportunities might be. We lose our capacity to step back and to see whether what we are doing is helpful or not to the particular circumstance. And so in emotional agility, I talk about very, very practical ways that people can start to develop this meta view, which, which I think is one of the, as mentioned earlier, the most critical skill sets we can develop. It is the ability to come from the place of the thinker driving the action rather than the thought. The place in yourself that's wise, that's, that's knowing, not as a I know it all, but the wise knowing place. Yeah that can help you to, to be effective. Yeah, because it's, it's great, you, you mentioned in your book about sort of, is the path you're going on going to take you to where you want to go in the end, which will, 
which we'll Correct. You know, come on to. Uh, um, and then you talk just briefly about trying to unhook. You talk about how to deal with the most negative emotions. You've got the bottlers and the brooders. The bottlers, um, uh, for example, um, can you just elaborate the difference between the bottlers? Sure, and the... <laughs> sure. So one of the things that I describe in emotional agility is that when people are hooked, and people, of course, can be hooked in organizations, or they can be hooked in a relationship, or they can be hooked even with themselves, but as mentioned, hooked is when your emotions and thoughts are driving the action rather than your values. So often when people are hooked, they start to engage in default behaviors around their emotions. Uh, the one is what I call bottling. And bottling is where the person pushes emotions aside. Um, I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't be worried. Let me just ignore it. At least I've got a job. Everything will be okay. I know my team's upset, but I just don't want to go there in case I open up a can of worms. Right. So that is what we call classic bottling behavior. Then you get the opposite, which is brooding. And brooding is the analysis by paralysis or the paralysis by analysis, uh, which is the thinking and overthinking and dwelling. I can't believe what he said to me. Uh, my manager said such and such, but actually what he's doing is different. And it's the thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. Now, what's fascinating is these two ways of being, bottling on the one hand, brooding on the other, look completely different. Okay? The one is ignoring your emotions and the other is dwelling in your emotions, uh, you know, to the nth degree. But these two ways, even though on the surface they look so different, are remarkably similar. In both cases, your emotions and thoughts are calling the shots. Even if the shots are to ignore, yeah. your emotions and thoughts are calling the shots. There is a fascinating body of research looking at people who, by default, bottle or brood. And what that research shows pretty clearly is that both bottling and brooding behaviors are associated with lower levels of well-being, lower levels of resilience, high levels of depression, high levels of anxiety. And what's even more fascinating when you speak with leaders around bottling and brooding, often leaders will say, um, I'm dealing with my emotions and thoughts in this way because I've just got to get on with the project. I've just got to get on with my job because that's going to, what's going to help me to be effective. But actually what the research shows is that bottling and brooding actually take up cognitive resources. And those cognitive resources paradoxically stop people from being able to problem solve, be effective. It's lower interpersonal relationships. People get more transactional. They're less effective with their teams. So bottling and brooding are done with the best of intentions, but serve neither the individual nor the organization and nor the person's ultimate effectiveness. Right. Sounds like I might be actually both of them. I don't know if that's possible to be both the bottler and the brooder, is it? So, <laughs> so yes, the answer is yes. Now, don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong no. with, on occasion, bottling or brooding. Yeah. Uh, one of the examples that I give in my book is if you've been, you know, dumped by your boyfriend the day before you take yeah. your big exam, by all means, bottle. Push it aside and get on with what you, sure. you need to do. Um, but a lot, of and a lot of people do flip between the two. They yeah. might push it aside and then think, oh, I need to focus on this. And then yeah. they focus and then they, they almost, you know, go backwards and forwards. Um, what I'm talking here, when I'm talking about uh, bottling and brooding being unhelpful, is when they become default go-to right. behaviors, where they become patterns or strategies or ways of dealing with difficulty. Yeah. And what we see with a lot of leaders is that they do become patterns. They become yeah. the go-to way that I deal with difficulty in okay. my life. Yeah, because the, the, the brooder sounds really bad. <laughs> I quote from the book, they, they tend to dump their real heavy emotions on others. They want to talk it out with those close to them, but, but even their nearest and dearest get empathy fatigue, eventually tiring of brooders constantly need to talk about fears, worries, and struggles. Um, and then, they, then, as you say, they, they sort of get worried about being, being so miserable, and is that going to happen? So it's a massive spiral down. So we've got A, B, um, is there an option C? So Yes, yes. So again, we're coming from the perspective of how do you get unhooked, and that bottling is not helpful and brooding is not helpful. 
So what I suggest in my book is skills that help us to develop this meta view, the ability to notice your emotion. So you're not ignoring your emotion. You're not bottling your emotion. You're noticing your emotion, but you are also uh, moving to a place where you are seeing your emotion for what it is. It's an emotion. It's a thought. It's not who I am. I get to choose my action in the circumstance. You say that when we show up fully with awareness and acceptance, even the worst demons usually back down. So it is about recognizing you are not perfect. We're not living in a perfect world and it's just part of the human existence. Yes, okay. yes. You, you talk about self-compassion being so essential, which is a, just for a minute on, on obviously I, I've got a feeling as to why it's so important, but, yeah. but, but you do talk about it in the book. Quite. I, I talk about it because I think it's critical. I think that so often in society and so often in organizations, we, we treat our lives if we, as if we are in a constant Iron Man or Iron Woman marathon. Um, let's be more productive and let's, you know, achieve the, the goals and it's, and uh, self-compassion is incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, self-compassion is often seen as being a sign of weakness or a sign of failure or that I'm going easy on myself. But in fact, the research shows the opposite. What the research shows is that when people are able to be kind to themselves, their failings, their losses, the um, disappointments, that it actually helps them to plan and be more effective in the future. It's when people hide from them or are punitive towards themselves that they often feel that they've got more to lose and so don't learn or mind the learning from their experiences. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you mentioned it's a beautiful point where if you came across a younger child version of yourself, you'd be compassionate with them. It's the same thing with the adult. Why wouldn't you do the same thing with the adult version? Yeah, you know, you, you work with leaders who lose large contracts or who fail at something or who are experiencing difficulty in their lives and often they beat themselves up about it. Yeah. But, but life is inseparable, the beauty from the fragility, the, the success from the failure. And so self-compassion allows us to hold both of those um, ways of being in our world. Yeah. And this applies equally and if not more importantly to organizational life. You, you mentioned something in there that, which I personally worried about a lot, which is uh, uh, you shouldn't also compare yourself with others, which I think I've got a personal trap on, but you, you say it's a contrast of facts and where you say, here's my advice, keep your eyes on, on your own work, not on comparing, uh, comparing others. Um, but, but how, but if you get fueled, for example, some people might think, well, comparing myself to others, whether it's organizations or individuals, gives me a sort of a competitive drive. So that's what feeds, that's what puts the Bunsen burner under my bottom every yes, morning. Yes, yes. Um, if you remove some of that, does that have a potential negative effect? Of well, so a lot of people compare themselves to others. Uh, what, the, what the research shows pretty clearly is that when you compare yourself yourselves to others, what it actually does is it evokes a very, very fragile self-concept because there's always going to be someone better, smarter, yeah. prettier, thinner, fitter than you. Not than you and me. And, but, uh, of course not. Of course else, not. Actually, yeah. <laughs> so there's always, so there's no end of the number of people that you can compare yourself to. And if we constantly are living in a world where we are comparing ourselves to others, you are in a perpetual state of setting yourself up for disappointment. Now, that's not to say that you might not be motivated, you know, that person got that deal and I want to, you know, get a bigger deal. That kind of thing can be very motivating for people. But a lot of people engage in ongoing uh, comparison with others. Now, the difficulty with this is not only are you in a situation where there's always going to be someone better, smarter and so on than you, um, but also the litmus of your success as an individual starts to be pegged to other people rather than pegged to what is most important to you intrinsically as an individual. So yes, Jack might be earning X amount, but Jack's lifestyle is not a lifestyle that I might want. And so when we are able to entertain the fact that actually this is 
congruent with me and my values and what's important to me, it's very, very freeing. So Susan, if we can change, uh, change gears a little bit, one of the things um, that you talk about is really powerful in the book is walking your why. Now, what, what on earth does that mean when it comes to emotional agility? So walking your why is the practice of walking towards your values, of taking action in a way that is concordant with your values. Very often, and I think this is especially because of all the rhetoric around values in organizations, values seem to be very abstract to people. Yet, one of the things that I explore in emotional agility is how critical knowing what is important to you is for your overall well-being and your life success. And I don't mean here success as defined by your tax return. I mean success as in defined by the way you actually live your life in a full way. So I'll give you an example. There's fascinating research showing that values are not simply nice to have, but that they are fundamental in buffering us and in helping us to be resilient in the changing context of day-to-day -day life. Two examples. The first is we engage in a lot of mindless activity and a lot of mindless decision making. We might go in directions in our career because everyone else in the firm is doing it or because we've been told that that is the route to go. And we might look back on our lives 10 or 15 years later and think, what was I doing? So the idea of walking your why is really being able to define what is personally important to you. There's some fascinating research that has been done on what we call social contagion. And social contagion is the idea that we literally catch other people's behaviors when we just mindlessly go through the world. For example, you sit on an airplane. If your seat partner, who you might not even know, buys sweets on the airplane, there's a 30% chance increase that you will buy sweets on the airplane. There's research that shows that if people in your social circle have put on weight, you, even if you don't know them, are likely to put on weight. And we're talking large epidemiological studies. If people in your social circle who you have never met get divorced, it increases your chance of getting divorced. Social contagion is the phenomenon whereby particular behaviors become normalized and then adopted in your own life. Now, this is very, very powerful. And what we know from the research is that having a clear sense of what your values are protects you. So it's not just nice to have, it actually protects you from these kinds of mindless outcomes. There's also been research, of course, very uh, pervasive and very important in organizational conversations at the moment, is the idea of unconscious bias, okay? Having biases um, around females, uh, around gender and so on, that are really important for organizations to work through effectively. But we also know that, that individuals take on the unconscious bias of society. So for example, if I'm a female working in an all-male environment, I might unwittingly have absorbed the unconscious bias that I'm in the wrong profession. Right. Okay? And we know that that is true. So we know, for example, that females who are in professions that have high levels of bias against females in that industry, when they experience hardship, when they experience career setbacks, when they experience failings, are more likely to give up, to just throw in the towel. However, if they've done a very simple exercise of articulating why it is that they are in that profession, why it is that they believe in the work that they do, that when they experience those failings and hardships, those values actually protect them from then just giving up and throwing in the towel. Right. So values are not just a nice to have, they are 
critically important to our life effectiveness. Yeah, you talk about, um, actually if we can just talk about women in business for, for a moment. Sure. Obviously, um, we are um, at Leaders in uh, making sure we interview, try and make, interview as many a diverse range as we as we possibly can um, but what's your thoughts on how can we ever live I mean I've got a little son and a little daughter the, the idea that my daughter hasn't got you know equality or you know equal opportunities as my little son drives me nuts but but how do you think we're going to get to a world where there is equality and what, I know you're we're, we're making steps and, and the case for equality is you know linking down to P&L between boards and p l is there but there is this unconscious bias still in 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 business. So how, how do we overcome this? So I, I feel very strongly about this issue. I see women's rights as human rights. Um, I don't see them as separately women's rights. These are human rights because I don't believe that it is good for any of us to exist in a world in which people are discriminated against, raped, tortured and so on simply for being female. And I think that this conversation is actually a conversation that happens very early. When we get to organizations, it's fun, it's, it's incredibly important, we should be having it at all levels of society. But I think, for example, with children, it's, um, it's critically important to be having conversations with our sons as equally with our daughters around the individual qualities that a person brings to the table that are not about who they are in terms of their gender, but who they are as people. And I think that this is a, a critically important Great. conversation to be yeah. having. Great. And we're going to get on to raising emotionally agile children then, but making sure they understand it's about the best brains for the role, whatever that is, as opposed to gender, sexual orientation, ethnic origins or anything else, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I think that, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in, in emotional agility is the, the idea of rigidity. And part of rigidity is going to quick biases and, and assigning people into categories, you know, male, female. Um, it's a sign of rigidity. And I certainly I know I've got a, an eight year old and a two year old. And I, you know, I'm very, very mindful to not have conversations about that's a boy's thing or that's a girl's thing in any aspect because I think it can just as easily harm boys when you start saying things like well that's a you know yeah. no it's a your thing if, yeah. if it's something that you believe in you need to walk your why yeah that's right talking about walk your why yes. coming up with the values then because people you know organizational values a lot of people say they're sort of you know fluffy but but if you look at the organizations that do the best that are worth billions of pounds they have they're living their values. They're not just stuck on the wall, they're living and breathing them. Yes. So, so from an individual perspective, if somebody's watching this and they say, okay, I want to be led by my values, I yes. want to walk my wine, how do they actually come up with those values in the first instance? Okay, so, so I go through a number of activities in the book about how people can actually start discerning what is important to them. You know, what are your values? But one of the most important things that I talk about in relation to this is that values are not something that you have on the proverbial wall, but the wall in your life rather they are qualities of action. So what I mean by this is, say your value is around health, or say your value is around inclusiveness. When you go into your next meeting, you are able to make what I call a toward move, which is a move toward your values, or an away move. They are qualities of action. So one of the things that I talk about in emotional agility is the concept of choice points. That when you are, for example, an individual who believes in learning and contribution, and you're sitting in that meeting and you have that sense of, ah, oh, I'm just a fraud, or gee, I've just been undermined. You are at a choice point. The choice point is, do you move toward your values so even though you're having this thought, even though you're having this voice, do you still continue to contribute? Or do you move away from your values and shut down? So values are qualities of action. 
you in the moment make a choice that is toward what is important to you or away. Fantastic. So I think that's a fan an excellent point. We interviewed Sir Terry Leahy, uh, former CEO of Tesco, who said that he's a self-proclaimed shy guy. He's the mm -hmm. most introverted CEO he knows, um, but he managed an organization of 300,000 people. So he believes in communications, massive, there's very strong value on communication yes. internally and externally. And that's what got him out of his shell is that that value sort of transcended or you know the sort of the concern of shyness that he yes, had. Yes, yes that's exactly the that's an exact example yeah. of not being driven by your thoughts emotions concern and choosing to walk your why choosing to walk towards what's important to you sometimes even despite your thoughts and emotions. Yeah, perfect. What about the link to organizations then so we talked about individual values here but you know Organizations talk about their values all the time. Where do a lot of them get it right or wrong? I mean, what's your what's your thought on the link between the two? So I have a very specific opinion on this. I work with a lot of organizations in relation to large scale organizational strategy. So the engagement strategy for 180,000 people or the people strategy for our entire organization. And I think one of the critical things that organizations completely miss is the idea that uh, people are not simply going to believe in something because you are telling them that it's your value. Um, I think that organizations actually need to get a lot better with understanding the psychology of motivation and emotions. And in the context of this conversation, of really appreciating that individuals are more likely to live an organization's values if they feel that their own personal values can be expressed in those organizational values. So this is really critical because a lot of times organizations create a sense of value but they or what their values are but what they don't do is help people to make a link, an explicit link between what I as an individual value and how that can be expressed. So I recently worked with an organization where we developed a um, online tool within the organization to help individuals to think about, this is the organization's value. These are my values. How can my value of caring about people be expressed in this organization's value of cooperation? in a way that helps individuals to be more connected with where the organization is. And I think that this is really important because every single organization that I know is having conversations about how do we be more adaptive? How do we be more flexible? And yet the conversation that is not happening is that you do not get an adaptive, agile organization without adaptive, agile people. And there is an essence that needs to happen here, which is the cultivation and helping individuals to be adaptive and agile. Yeah. So organizations making sure they hire people that have got similar congruent values to themselves. Because Richard Reed, a guy from Innocent Drinks, I don't know if it ever got over to the USA, but he said the number one thing you can do to impact your culture is to hire is the people you hire. The people that you hire and the values that they bring into the organization, you've got to allow them to be authentic. Um, Perfect. And then you maybe one of the values is we hire people that think differently, like the old yes. no, Apple. Yeah. Um, what, what about um, a very personal thing here? But you do talk about goal conflict as well. So let's just say somebody you know uh, sees themselves as a great father or a great mother, uh, but they also see themselves labelled as a great career man, career business person. How? How do they manage that? You, you talk about sort of not the need for this obsessive work-life balance thing, but work, they don't need to be in conflict with each other. I'm going to be talking about that. Can you just? Yeah, I think I think that um, often when we think about work-life balance, I, I, I actually think the term is a bit of a nonsense because what it does is it implies that life is everything that happens outside of work, whereas actually for a lot of people, work is a place of meaning and connection and import. But 
one thing that I think is really critical is to not get too rigid and binary with ourselves. It's not as if it's an either or, you know, I either love my career or I'm an effective parent. So again, the idea of values being qualities of action is how can I bring myself in a values congruent way to the work that I do when I'm at work. But by the same token, when I'm at home, how can I bring myself in a values congruent way to being with my child who's in front of me? And so in that example, being with your child and being on your cell phone, checking emails at the same time, might be in a way move for you. It might be values incongruent. So it's not this binary either or, but rather an and. How can I bring myself fully in an engaged way to the situation that I'm in that's concordant with my values? Yeah, that's brilliant. So, so you talk about being, if you're emotionally rigid, you leave at five o'clock no matter what because you've got to get home to the kids and then that's, that's, a, that's not the agile way of doing things. Sure. And, and that's all of the CEOs we've interviewed talk about the, that exactly that sort of work-life um, integration. Yes. If you've got to do something important for the kids or the family during work, that's fine. If you have to do work in the evening time, it, but it's about being agile. I think it's, I think it's uh, fantastic. So you mentioned there about the cell phone and, and, and the kids, um, and it leads us into the, onto the, uh, the fine tweaks principle and talk about how important habits are um, to, uh, for example, you, you, you walk in the house, you drop the keys, you drop your cell phone there as well. Um, but you say little things mean a lot and you should tweak our way to success. What, what, what is this principle, the fine tweaks principle? So most work in uh, transformation or most work in personal growth or change implies that change in our lives comes about through massive large-scale change. Yeah. I need to throw in my career and go live in the country or I need to you know, do something dramatic. Whereas actually what the research shows is that there is a huge amount to be gained through what I call tiny tweaks. And that is finding ways in your life where you can make shifts in your motivation, your mindset, your habits, such that they are values congruent. And I give a number of examples in the book. Susan, we've covered a, a lot today, so thank you very much indeed. If we, one of the things I think is really real and, and great about the book is that it brings it back down to the, uh, the children. You know, how do we, the, the chapter is called Raising Emotionally Agile Children. As you said earlier on in the interview, uh, about gender equality, it all starts with having honest conversations with the kids. So in a nutshell, how, how do you raise emotionally agile children? I've got two of my own, so I, I better be listening to this. <laughs> so I should say that I loved writing this chapter. I've got two of my own children. I've got a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. And uh, this was just an incredibly meaningful part of the work which was to take the model that I've articulated earlier on, the, the showing up, the stepping out, the walking your why and moving on, and looking at how that applies in raising children. So a couple of examples or a couple of key principles. The first is that we know that being seen is just so incredibly important to children. And what I mean by being seen is your child comes home from school and is upset because no one would play with them and they are sad and they are experiencing that sadness. And yet so often with the best of intentions, we don't see or don't want to see because it's difficult for us as parents to see the heartache that that child is experiencing. And so often what we do is we try to go to solution to make nice. In effect, what we teach our children to do is to bottle. So we might do things like say to a child, um, no one will play with you at school. I'm so sorry. I'll play with you. Why don't we go bake cupcakes together? Okay. It's done with the best of intentions. I've done it. I'm guilty as charged. But what we do when we have that kind of interaction is we are encouraging our children to simply gloss over their emotional experience and they are not being seen. Now what's critical is earlier in the interview I spoke about the development of meta emotion skills. The ability to rise above your emotions and thoughts and to see them for what they are, they emotions and thoughts. 
So we then ask the question, how do we start developing that skill in children? The answer is that children are only able to recognize that emotions pass if they are allowed to feel their emotions. You only start realizing that you're more upset about something than everyone else in the boardroom if you, with your children and as a child, are allowed to experience an emotion and recognize that you're really upset about this but none of your other five-year-old friends are. Okay? So one of the first things that's really important in parenting is to be able to show up to your children's emotions and to help them to show up to their emotions because that helps children to actually develop this meta emotion skill of recognizing that emotions pass. Now, critically important, I don't mean dwelling on, ruminating, uh, brooding on emotion. I mean helping children to see their emotions, to label their emotions, and for the child to start to develop a sense of, if I do A, I will feel better. If I do B, I will feel worse, rather than the parent trying to make things right for the child. You talk about uh, autonomy, and one of the ones you say, for example, is you say minimize external rewards such as stickers, toys, sweets, or the cachet f uh, for doing things. So, you know, how, how do you build or, or create autonomous children? So autonomy is, I think, one of the most critical concepts, not just for children, but for individuals and organizations, yeah. okay? It's the idea as an individual that your actions are driven by something that you believe in and truly hold to be important. Yeah. Um, and in the exact same way as in organizations, just telling people to believe in the strategy because you tell them to, yeah. uh, doesn't allow for or engage in autonomous action. The same applies in children. Uh, we have become highly extrinsically motivated and we use many extrinsic motivators in society. We give people and children in particular, we might give them Smarties or M&Ms because they pee in a potty or we have multiple sticker charts and everything lands up being about checks and measures and um, external. Mm. And there is a massive body of research showing that children who do better in life are children who are able to start discerning what is important to them. Their own sense of pride, because I peed in the potty as an example, yeah. as opposed to I'm just doing it for the money or for the M&Ms. So in the book, one of the things that I talk about is ways that we can encourage autonomy in our children. Um, and I give some examples around minimizing extrinsic reward, um, being able to give a rationale. There are times mm. where you say to a child, you have to hold my hand mm. when we cross the street. Okay, there are times where there is no choice. When there is no choice, accompanying the no choice with a thought out rationale, hold my hand when we cross the street because people will be able to see me and they can't see you, that is autonomy encouraging. The exact same in organizations, you cannot tell people to simply believe in something because you as the boss told them to. There are going to be times when there are changes in policy or changes in strategy that just are. And the way that we encourage autonomy in that context is by helping people to understand, truly understand, the rationale that underpins the decision. Perfect. So it's about getting them to understand the logic. It's not, not just following for conformity's sake. Um, you, you talk about your, your, your son being on a diving board at one point and having that freeze, sort of frozen moment on the diving board, having to face their fears. And, and I've, I, I've just sort of with some of my friends that are growing up in the same sort of you know, kids as I've got, um, I've seen some, some uh, you know, fathers and, and mothers all force their kids down the, the slide and they're scared, they're scared the pants off them. Others sort of you know, just allow their kids to walk away and then just 
you know, they don't have to go down because mummy and daddy's not going to push them down it. H how do you handle that diving board moment? I mean, do you, <laughs> should you be pushing the kids down the slides into the pool? So let me just say that I am by no means perfect with this. Um, I, I give some examples in the book of times when I've slipped up. But I am very often having conversations with my children about what is your why? What is important to you? Not just because I want you to get off the diving board or I want you to do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. What is important to you? And with that example that I give about my child being really fearful, I could very easily have said to him, just dive, it'll be okay. Mm. Or, poor thing, you don't want to dive, it's fine, you don't have to. But either one of those things would have been a non-emotionally agility supportive. It would not have cultivated emotional agility. To force a child to do something just because you want them to do it does not encourage them to get a sense of why something is important for themselves or to harness their own sense of strength and skill. But by the same token, simply giving them an easy out sends them the message that sometimes things are important to them, but they can just bow out. So the conversation that I was having with my child and that I try to have with my children often is, why is this thing important to you? Why is diving off the diving board important to you? And how can you have a choice point. How can you move to what, towards what is important to you, even if you feel scared? One of the things that I talk about in the book is that when people talk about courage, they talk about crushing your fear. You know, this idea of managing your fear or crushing your fear. And one of the things that I propose in the book is, again, we don't need to manage our fear or wrestle with our fear. Our fear just is. It's human. So courage is not about the absence of fear. Courage is fear walking. What I mean here is that courage is not about pushing fear aside or pretending that your fear doesn't exist. Courage is about being able to hold your fear and still walk towards what is important to you. And the example of the diving board was exactly that context. Can you be scared and still jump? Because that is sometimes what we need to be able to learn to do in life and work. Yeah, you, you, you talk about the whole thing about is, you know, you've got to uh, choose courage over uh, comfort and, and that's essential and you know no matter what age but what age talking about age appropriate what age can you start having conversations with your kids about feeling the fear and doing it anyway so I think the conversations can start really early and they they start actually with the conversations about what fear is in other words helping children to recognize their emotions and their own sense of autonomy so a, a very, very young example of this is that when you've got a baby and you are having a conversation with your baby and your baby might even be only six months old, um, simply being able to recognize and verbalize you're feeling sad, you feel, you, you know, so starting to help the child get language around emotions is very, very important. Um, it's, it's in fact one of the most critical emotional agility skills that we can develop, being able to label our own emotional experience. Um, but from a very, very young age, from around the age of um, 18 months to two years old, one can start having conversations with children around their emotions. For example, if your child is upset mm. about whatever, a very common response is what we call minimizing. Minimizing is, oh, don't be upset, it'll be okay. Again, done with the best of, in, of intentions, and I'm guilty of this, but what that is called is, is it's minimizing. It's basically saying to the child, you're feeling something, but there's no need for you to feel it. 
Okay? And the research shows that that actually impacts on the child's ability to develop these kinds of emotional skills later on in life. So from a practical perspective, from a very, very young age, we want to start having conversations with, are you feeling sad or disappointed? So helping children to discern what their emotion is, or are you feeling sad or mad? You know, again, mm. depending on the age of the child. Um, again, at very, very young age, we know that children can start articulating what will help them to feel better. So instead of you running in and trying to make things right, Sophie, that's my daughter's name, I can see you really sad about the fact that you can't do X or Y. What would help you in this situation? Do you want some time to yourself? Would you, do you want mommy to read you a book? Should we go for a walk together? My child is two years old and she can tell me which of those things would be most helpful to her. So what we want to start doing is, is at that very young age, helping children to develop language around emotions and also helping children to develop what we call emotional self-efficacy. And that is the idea that I can exert some choice in the situation and that my choice matters. Right, so never underestimate the little ones on uh, coming up with their own solutions, even at the age of two. Yeah, at, at a very young age, you, can, you might offer them a range of solutions and ask them to choose, whereas at an older age, the child can offer their own solutions. Yeah. Do you think things like, um, I mean, all kids are going to feel fear and anger and excitement and happiness and the whole range of emotions, but do you think the whole thing about the courage quotient is that, because you talk about sort of you know, choosing courage, not, not comfort, and uh, do you think that is some kids are just born courageous, or do you think you can lead them to, to, to be more courageous over their childhood and then into adult years? There, there's definitely personality predisposition around people's sense of uh, risk taking, for example. This is, uh, you know, clear in the research. But again, I think that one of the things that I love and find so passionate about the idea of emotional agility is that it doesn't matter who you are, you are able to develop a sense of choice as to what it is that is important to you and move towards that. And that might be regardless of your baseline level of courage around that particular activity. If it's important, can you walk towards the thing that matters? Perfect. And I suppose as we as adults, role play, sorry, not role play, um, modeling is absolutely essential, isn't it? That's the, that's the key thing for our little kids growing up is that we are actually being the emotional intelligent people and parents we want to be. Correct, that, that what you're doing in this context is you are showing up to your children, you also being able to step out of and not be hooked by sometimes the emotions you might experience with them, that you're able to show them how you operate from a sense of what's important and values-based to you and even articulate them, yeah. articulate those values to your children and then show them how you take action in ways that are concordant with that. I have to be careful what I do when I get home this evening. <laughs> Susan, I just want to say on behalf of all of the viewers watching, uh, on behalf of uh, everybody that you'll have moved during this interview, I just want to say thank you so much for thank your time. You. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Brilliant.